Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. So today we talked about nightmares, and we had requested nightmares from listeners, and we got lots and lots of great, uh, I guess I guess they're great, um, contributions. So we picked out several and spoke about them. We talked a little bit about Jung's nightmare that he had when he was a child. We talked about post-traumatic stress nightmares, regular nightmares, childhood nightmares, and uh, all things nightmare. So I hope you enjoy it. It was so great to get all of your submissions. We put this call out. Oh my we kind of had this idea, you know, like let's talk about nightmares and and uh, just these. We were just inundated with a veritable tsunami of nightmare images, which was <laughs> wonderful. So thank you. And we have a tsunami nightmare. <laughs> yeah, we yeah we do, as as we might you know as you might anticipate, we do have a tsunami nightmare. So uh, one of the things that I found so interesting is so many people sent us their childhood nightmares, mm -hmm. and of course when we talk about nightmares, you know they're very very common in childhood and. I was impressed with how many people had these memories of these, you know, early childhood nightmares. And I, I think my earliest dream memory, as far as I can recall, was a, is a nightmare memory. Yeah. Uh, and, and Jung's earliest dream yeah. memory, it was a nightmare that we'll mm -hmm. get to later. Me too. Well, nightmare yes, is my you first, too, I remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they really, they really make an impression on us, mm -hmm. don't they? Which I think is part of the point. You know, I dipped into a little bit of the research about nightmares and their treatment, because for some people, nightmares are really distressing. They make you not want to go to sleep. Um, yeah. And I've, and I've worked with people like this. And mm -hmm. so just a kind of quick overview of some of the science around nightmares. First of all, researchers break them into two categories, what they call idiopathic nightmares that are just sort of normal, naturally occurring nightmares, and then post-traumatic stress nightmares, which are very particular. And I, I imagine we'll touch on those today, but mostly we're going to be focusing on, on uh, just kind of average nightmares, I'll say. And, you know, the researchers that I read up on kind of said like, eh, the content doesn't matter. This is really about, you know, anxiety. And uh, there are some, there's a recommended treatment called image rehearsal therapy, which mm -hmm. in, in some ways has a little overlap with active imagination act actually. But, but of course, we do believe that the content matters, right? Uh, Jung says over and over again, uh, stick to the dream. What does the dream say? The specific image in the dream uh, really matters. There's a difference between, um, you know, falling down a flight of stairs and drowning in a tsunami or a hundred other things that make up the content of nightmares. Because I think that dreams are a form of medicine. Hmm. I just say, think that nightmares are kind of bitter medicine. <laughs> That's and, great. <laughs> and some medicines are really sweet and cherry flavored, but they're all medicinal. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah. I mean, sometimes you go to the doctor and it hurts. Yeah. You have to get a shot or, yeah. yeah exactly. And nightmares are kind of a shot in the arm. <laughs> yes. You know. Yeah. Like every other dream, nightmares call us to an encounter with our own psyche. What is going on here? How do I understand this? Well, and that's the rub, right? Because when a nightmare is happening, often we're distressed in one way or another. 
Yeah. And just as it is in our waking life, that if we're in a state of hyperarousal, that thoughtful part of the brain is kind of taken offline a bit. Mm -hmm. We get into this fight or flight mode, and that can happen to the dream ego as well. So part of the discipline, sometimes after the fact, is to be able mm -hmm. to look at the dream and not run away, even though we might have run away when we were asleep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as we grow uh, and develop a more sense of self, more ego strength, a better understanding of how the psyche works, etc., we are better able to really encounter uh, the content of a nightmare. Um, and with children, with their egos still in the process of development, you know, have nightmares. And of course, they can't quite confront them. But it, it's, uh, you know, the contents of the unconscious are, are coming through in a way that's hard for them, that they don't really have the consciousness to process yet um, with the stresses and strains of growing up and learning to wait your turn and use good table manners and um, you know, not hit your sibling and all the stuff that we require kids to do. Right. And I think that that's the medicine of a Jungian approach in a way, because mm -hmm. uh, some of the research was talking about how, how what, what can be really difficult about having nightmares is when we avoid them. Mm. Or we imagine, for example, that they're predictive or that they mean mm. we're going crazy. Right. But when we say, no, 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 look, this is just your unconscious giving you information in the way the unconscious does. And, you know, the unconscious is, um, I always think of the unconscious mm -hmm. as very dramatic and it loves hyperbole. <laughs> and the dream maker will often mm -hmm. overstate things wildly, especially when it's trying to get your attention and it feels like yeah. you're not listening. And, it, it, and so it's, it's normalizing it, you know, that there's nothing actually... It's mm. the fact that you're, the nightmare might be frightening. The fact that you're having the nightmare shouldn't be frightening. Yeah. And that uh, the collective unconscious, you know, the home of archetypes and mythological images, uh, these universals are, are very powerful. And nightmares that, you know, have to do with disasters and, you know, sort of horrible things, uh, really borrow content from the collective unconscious. And that can be scary to the ego. But on the other hand, people have dreams where something numinous, miraculous, and glorious has visited and they go, wow, you know, I had this incredible dream. So part of the problem is egos value judgments about what is a quote, good dream and what is a quote, bad dream versus this is a dream it was very powerful it had a lot of powerful content uh it was upsetting and disturbing now it's my job to understand it mm -hmm. and, and part of the understanding which i think is so essential is to shift out of a literal relationship mm. to the images into the symbolic attitude sure which yes. for young and jungians is the primary discipline but you can also think of it as a vaccination, mm -hmm. that if you really hold tight to things being symbolic, it actually protects you from becoming unwell by thinking every dream image is literal, or as you said, Lisa, uh, prophetic mm -hmm. in some fashion, that the symbolic attitude gives us the breathing room to lift something to a metaphoric level and then as a metaphor, we might find that it's useful in many different circumstances mm -hmm. because then it becomes a pattern. Mm -hmm. And that's particularly important as you'll see today, folks, that there are some dream images that are a little bit gruesome. And if we take them literally, yeah. they're just yes. gruesome or hor horrific and triggering. Yeah. But taken symbolically, we're able to walk closer to the image than we would possibly have wanted to if it was a literal thing. So should we go to one of these uh, gruesome dream images? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah.
This is a dream uh, from a woman who's in her early 50s and she's an artist. I'm grilling on the barbecue. I anticipate seeing chopped spiced meat on a plancha type grill for tacos. I'm hungry and can't wait to eat. But when I lift the lid of the grill, I see charred cats. Their teeth are exposed and their eyes are bugged out. Some are lying directly on charcoal briquettes. I try to move them with tongs and they are stuck to the coals. I try to scrape off some of the charred fur, but it is hopelessly unappetizing. And for context, she says, I'm traveling internationally solo, struggling with loneliness, recovering from the flu. I have a chronic illness and am unable to do many of the things I planned. I'm struggling to process the horrific news of the attacks in Israel in October. During the pandemic, I spent a lot of time out at a cabin in the woods barbecuing with my boyfriend. Fall is my favorite time of year to go there, but this year I went on an extended trip alone out of the country. During the pandemic, I had many dreams about defrosting meat and spoiling uncooked meat. I have joked that my animus is a suburban dad who likes to drink beer and barbecue. The image of the burnt cats was so shocking to me that I woke up in a sweat. The main feelings in the dream were disgust, surprise, and horror. And for further context, she adds, the cats are trussed up and remind me of Egyptian cat mummies. Many of my solo travel Facebook groups are discussing whether to cancel trips to Egypt. I googled cat mummies and found they were sacrificed to a goddess. Mm. And uh, I would just note for wider context that uh, dreams of injured animals, animals falling from the sky, uh, abandoned animals that should have been fed and are wasting away, of animals often show up as a theme in, in nightmares. And um, this is a particularly vivid image, isn't mm -hmm. it? Mm -hmm. This is one that makes us all go, ooh. Yeah, I mean, it's this, you know, their eyes are bugging out and their teeth. Yes. You know, their but, but it's interesting, right? Because one of the things is that she says, um, oh, gosh, it's unappetizing. You know, it, it's not <laughs> like, oh, the poor cats, let me see if I can save them. It's more like, uh, oh, this isn't, <laughs> this isn't really what I want to eat, you know? Yeah, it seems like she is evaluating it as food. Yes. But the dream eater yes. kind of gotten <laughs> past what right. a cat may mean. And of mm -hmm. course, in, in other cultures, cats, dogs, all kinds of um, wildlife and animals of different kinds are considered uh, food sources. Uh, here in mm -hmm. Western Europe and America, we think of cats and dogs as pets, but of course that's not true in all cultures. But it is an interesting uh, place in this dream because the dream ego is not horrified so much, I think, by the fact that they are cats right. as much by the fact that it's, gr it's gruesome and, uh, you know, they're charred. So, so it, it might be a place where we would sort of be curious about the, the, uh, dis the difference between the attitude in the dream and what we might feel in real life. Like if you, if you were at a barbecue and you found out you were going to be served cat, you might be pretty <laughs> horrified. Um, you know, this, this is where, I mean, so obviously the, the highlight here is something like gruesome or horror, but, uh, but again, getting drilling down into the specifics, I think is kind of where the symbolic level, that's where the medicine is. Uh, I, I was struck by the fact that she said it, it was, you know, unappetizing. And then she said later, she's doing this solo trip and she's uh, unable to do the things she'd hoped. So somehow maybe this, this trip that she's taken is not as appetizing as she hoped it would be, mm -hmm. that there might, there, there's sort of like a reality there, but, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing that there might also be deeper meetings this this um, image of the, the cats kind of looking like mummies. What do we think of that? Well, I just want to um, 
pop up to the beginning of the dream, then we can pop down. It's very important to me that she says, I am grilling mm -hmm. on the barbecue. Mm -hmm. Because even though the dream ah. video isn't, says, oh, I'm surprised there are cats there. I thought they would just be this spiced meat. But the implication is that I have put cats right on yeah. the coals yeah. um, previously to cook them. And somehow I had forgotten that. And now I'm, I'm surprised yeah, that's at, at the results. Yeah. I thought this was going to be nutritious or delicious. And so there's a, there's a surprise about something that she perhaps has chosen to do, which goes back to what you were saying about perhaps mm -hmm. some ambivalence about mm -hmm. some other choice that had been made. Mm -hmm. But we, you were asking about the mummified cats, mm -hmm. um, which they find, uh, with Egyptian mummies and in the pyramids and tombs very, mm -hmm. very frequently. Mm -hmm. The most uh, commonly found mummified animal in Egypt. Is a cat? Or cats. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm thinking that this dream really lifts up the shadow side of something that she typically uh, enjoys, that she likes to barbecue, she spent a lot of time out in the woods with her boyfriend barbecuing. Um, her joke about her animus is uh, a suburban dad who likes to drink beer and barbecue. Mm -hmm. So here's, and that she was hoping, um, you know, to, to travel and she's been traveling. So all these things that are supposed to be, you know, good, pleasant, fun, enjoyable. Uh, now all of a sudden the shadow side has been lifted up. Uh, with this uh, gruesome image uh, of the cats lying right on the charcoal briquettes. A and that this is a real surprise that, that all these things that are associated with pleasure have such a dramatic shadow. Mm -hmm. but holding that, what I want to do is just to hover a little higher above the dream. <laughs> and just think about it thematically. So the ego has been preparing something that ideally will uh, give her nutrition, will feed her. I mean, the reason that we cook things, aside from perhaps enhancing the flavor, is it makes things edible because raw things are much more difficult to digest. Also, uh, as humans, we learned how to cook for a number of reasons. It preserves things, kills bacteria, breaks down the protein, mm -hmm. the disulfide bonds are broken down, and then your body can get more nutrition out of it. So something in her psyche needs to digest or make the cat digestible by putting it through mm -hmm. a cooking process. Mm -hmm. That raw cat um, would be too much too much to take in. So now there's a calcinatio, a cooking process, a heating process that's being done to whatever the cat represents. And it seems like the cooking process has gone to the other extreme. Of Now it's inedible. Uh, it's stuck to the coals and, and burned. Uh, the psyche may be working on... Um, something that is more digestible, something that it, it is able to be assimilated a little better versus the polarity of raw to, or burned. Well, what I would like to um, suggest is that she's taking the cats off prematurely. Um, and this goes to a, look, just a strange reference that... <laughs> <laughs> okay, Chinese, go for it. <laughs> in traditional Chinese medicine, which is thousands of years old, there's an idea called the doctrine of signatures, that because there weren't all of these kind of laboratory environments, that um, discovering what the chemical properties of various things were was kind of experimental. So often you would look at something, an animal, a part of an animal, plant, a root, a flower, and it became metaphorically interesting. So, for instance, a, one ancient Chinese medicinal remedy would be to take a mole and to bake it 
and then grind it into a powder ah. and then administer it as part of a larger alchemical recipe. Um, rhino horns. This is, this is a great conflict. Um, rhinoceri are hunted. Their horns are harvested. Because of the stiffness of the horn in the doctrine of signatures, it's thought to be an erection remedy. And it's ground down into a powder, and then it's mixed in with other things. So the cat that's being put out, it, it hasn't gotten to the point where it could be ground down to a powder. Mm. But the association that you pointed out, Lisa, to them being mummified, um, if they had gotten to that desiccated state, one could actually grind them down. And a little uh, gruesome fact that uh, in the Victorian era, when there was this great pilfering of uh, tombs, um, ground mummy powder was actually a remedy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I too remember hearing about that. You know, and if we're thinking about the cat as a remedy or a cat that needs to, something that needs to be digested, so what are we really talking about? And I, I, I did a little uh, d um, research a minute ago on on the Egyptian goddess to whom cats were sacred, and of course it's Bastet. And, uh, you know, she was the goddess of, among other things, um, pregnancy and childbirth. And um, I, I wonder what the relationship here is with the feminine. You know, cats we think of as, as being feminine. Uh, you know, there, there are goddesses invoked in the imagery. W where is that in the dreamer's life? Um, you know, I, of course, I could go off in some wild speculation, but I, I will say that uh, she, it sounds from her associations that she is feeling ambivalent about her solo trip, which I imagine she must have planned and she must have had positive expectations for. Yeah. And now actually it's plunging her into something different. She's feeling lonely. She's, um, she's maybe rethinking it. It's not as pleasant as what she did in previous autumns. And and is there a link there, perhaps, to how she relates to the feminine mm -hmm. principle? I, I anything beyond that would just be wild speculation on my part. Yeah. yeah. But I, I'm wondering if if it feels right to um, maybe uh, veer off and and go to another nightmare, since we have so very many. Um, Joseph, do you want to? share with us a tidal mm. wave nightmare yes this is a nightmare submitted by a 28 year old female she works as a psychologist and titles this dream tsunami i'm walking alone on a beach the beach is pristine expansive the overall feeling is peaceful calm the light is either early morning or late afternoon, I'm not sure, but the light is soft and misty. I was neither hot nor cold. I remember looking out at the ocean, which was a normal open surf beach, but then my attention was drawn to a roaring sound, and the ocean started to change. The feeling changed to apprehension. I faced the surf and almost immediately saw an enormous wall of ocean building up in front of me. All I could see was a wave, and all I could hear was a roar of water. I felt totally overwhelmed, could not move. The wave engulfed me. I felt totally alone and exposed. Then I woke up feeling anxious, breathless, my heart pounding. And for context, she says, a dream I had many years ago, I was 28 and pregnant with my second child, my first child was about 18 months at the time. Both children were planned and love. A supportive and loving relationship with my husband, no external stressors, no medical problems. Healthy pregnancies, loved being pregnant, was very healthy. But my first child was an emergency cesarean. The feelings in the dream, she says, started as calm, peaceful, Feelings changed gradually through the dream, and I became appreh apprehensive. 
and overwhelmed and frightened and felt totally alone. Some associations she has are with pregnancy and motherhood, both she as a mother and also not having a mother because her mother died at 42. Mm-hmm. Mm. Um, and, and I just want to note that although uh, she says her age is 28, I think she means she was 28 at the time she had the dream because clearly she's yes. older now. Okay. And, and I think that the context this dreamer gives us, you know, she's always almost kind of making a point that there wasn't anything particularly difficult or stressful or distressing going on in her outer life at the time. And, and this, this is an interesting point, because I think sometimes we're very, very stressed mm-hmm. and we have dreams that are laden with anxiety and can be nightmarish. And it kind of comes as no surprise But sometimes nightmares really do rise up from a deeper place, and it doesn't seem connected with any of the real-life context that's going on. I mean, you know, this is a common kind of dream, a tsunami Mm -hmm. dream. And, of course, in terms of just uh, a look at the archetypal nature of that image, being unexpectedly swallowed up by the ocean, it's like being inundated by the unconscious in a way that feels absolutely existentially threatening. The primary fear on a symbolic level is of being engulfed. And Mm -hmm. so if we translate that into a psychological feeling, we might feel the tsunami of a new job, the tsunami of discovering we're pregnant or having a new baby or the tsunami of a spouse saying, I'm leaving, the the tsunami of feelings that Uh can rise up temporarily at least, and and we're so full of surprise, shock, and apprehension, it's even hard to think. What's interesting about it being a tsunami is that it is a, a general engulfing. The tsunami could be full of a number of things, anything could float on water, but it's the water itself. So when we're engulfed in the unconscious, it suggests that we are less conscious. We're not able to track the things we would normally track. Perhaps we're also misinterpreting things that are happening around us because the unconscious has all kinds of complexes in it. We might feel suddenly that we are in an exaggeratedly um, dangerous situation, all kinds of uncanny things can occur to us when we're engulfed in the unconscious. But one mm-hmm. thing is sure is that we are less alert. Mm-hmm. We're in that abasement state, a dimming of consciousness. And, and that can be scary depending on the environment you know, that we're in. Sometimes we have to be wide awake, and that's not always granted to us. Well, and, and I, with tsunami dreams, sometimes I think about Jung's uh, quote that uh, an encounter with the self is a defeat for the ego, that this is a real encounter with something of enormous archetypal power. And it, it you know, I mean, what we might assume from this dream, we don't see this in the dream, but that the the dream ego doesn't survive, uh, or at least doesn't stand a good chance. And that often happens in dreams where there's an implied death, maybe even our own death. And it's important to remember that that's an image of the, say, the death of the dominant attitude that something has to kind of give way. I mean, we don't have a lot of information about the dreamer's psychology, but she was 28, which as we've talked about before on the podcast oh, is yes. Saturn Return. And she mentions that she lost her own mother. We don't know how old she was when that happened. But being a mother and having lost a mother can can bring up a lot yeah. from the unconscious. I, I am thinking of uh, the ocean. And as um, everybody knows, I, I live on Cape Cod. And I'm at the beach a lot. And uh, we forget that the great mother the ocean that is generative 
of everything from shrimp to whales uh, has a negative as well as a positive valence. It's archetypal. Um, Mother Nature is both light and dark. And it's, it's so easy to forget uh, walking on the beach uh, in that kind of uh, reverie, which is what our dream ego is experiencing, that it's peaceful and calm and mm. it's soft and it's misty, uh, that, that this needs to be respected. Yeah, that's a good it's, point, Deb. It, it's not just nice. Yeah. And, um, you know, we've seen the beach, too, when a huge storm, uh, a nor'easter, even a hurricane is coming, and the destruction of the dunes are gone, the dune grass is gone, it, it floods over everything. Uh, that power and that force and that, you know, this is a realm that we live in. What I also want to add is just uh, the importance of the feeling uh, in a dream like this, of uh, everything is okay in my life. I, I was just walking on the beach. Uh, you know, what, what the heck happened here? Well, what did I do to deserve this? Um, and that feeling when we are flooded with uh, th those kinds of feelings may ask us to address our innocence, what we're taking for granted, mm -hmm. uh, to just remember that, uh, that this is the other side, this is the underbelly, this is the other part of reality. I think that maps on to... Um the situation she was in when she had the dream that she had had a successful first birth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Her child was 18 months old, planned, loved, things are going mm -hmm. well, there's a second child. The second child came through an emergency cesarean. So um, she's no, this, first child. Oh, excuse me. The first child was an emergency cesarean. Yeah. So as she's pregnant with the second child, the tsunami, one, could be a big upwelling of concern and fear as the pregnancy is proceeding, and will there be another emergency with the birth, because that's pending. But also, as you were saying, Deb, with the, the tension between being innocent and then something else being mm -hmm. in the unconscious, it's not uncommon for people to play on, oh, we're going to have two kids, let's have four kids. Well, you know, let's do another kid. And many times in the enthusiasm and the fantasy of building a family, there's an underbelly of overwhelm that can be present. This is going to double the amount of time and work, and this is going to be really challenging in many ways. And a lot of times when we're in a euphoric um, expectation, we're, we're not paying attention to the other challenges and things that can feel very overwhelming, including the possibility of postpartum depression, which could be yeah. symbolized by, you know, being overtaken by an ocean for some period of time. You had brought up the flooding as well. And the other thing I would say is that the great cosmic floods, you know, wiped the world clean, and there was an opportunity for a new start. And yet that's really frightening. So as you were saying, Lisa, a new attitude may be required with the addition of the second child. And that requirement might feel um, stunning mm -hmm. and overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I also wonder if there's a theme here around uh, motherhood. Uh, that uh, the first child... An emergency C-section is alarming. Uh, maybe, it's, maybe it's alarming. Well, For some people, it is. Yeah, I think the uh, word emergency well, makes it seem that way, not a C-section in and of uh, itself. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It's well, the I mean, emergency. I had an emergency C-section. And I mean, yes, they alarming. can be very alarming, but they can also be like, oh, well, I guess we have to do that. So 
Right. One can deal yeah. with it. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. But it's it's unexpected. Yes. Uh, that's uh that's where I was headed. Is uh that's like, you know, you're walking along at the beach. I'm having a wonderful, healthy pregnancy with a child that's planned, loved, wanted, right. and then kaboom, um, we have to go to the hospital and this is unexpected. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, we don't know when she lost her mother, but what, you know, new mothers need mothering. Yep. Yeah. And uh, we want our own mothers there to... Uh, take an interest and help out and give advice, uh, even if we don't follow their advice, <laughs> mm. uh, that there is a generational link to the mother we had as we become a mother uh, ourselves. A- and the advent of a second child changes everything. First Absolutely. child changes everything mm-hmm. too. Right. But you can be in love with that first baby. And then all of a sudden you have you know, a toddler and a newborn. and um, you're on deck all day, every day, twenty four seven. So absolutely, um, I'm just wondering about uh, all these themes and how they might uh, play a role in in this dream. Also, I'm also wondering about mortality. Yeah. Her mother mm-hmm. died young. Um, she is uh, advancing in age, and with a second child, I've I've known a number. I've had many analysands whose parents died younger and there is a very strong concern Mm -hmm. that as they move towards that same age some ill fate will come to them yep uh, so any number of those things could be suggested by the overwhelm Mm -hmm. feeling yeah yeah should we uh move on to another dream perhaps okay joseph i think you have another one Oh, all right. Blood red sky. The red uh, cave. Let me just yes. see. Okay. So this dream was submitted by a 37 year old female uh, who is a stay at home parent. This is her dream. I was inside a large cave with a clear view to a large opening showing a blood-red sky, the light of which filtered into the interior, casting everything in shades of dark red and shadows. I was lying flat on my back, bound by invisible chains to a metal surgical table and unable to move. I am either still pregnant and about to have my baby surgically removed from my abdomen, or it has already happened and I'm lying there cut open. I can see and hear many other women in the same exact position and situation as myself on other beds scattered throughout the cave. The atmosphere is dismal and the feeling is one of despair and inevitability. There's no fight within me, only a deep sadness and an overwhelming feeling of dread. Hmm. For context, she says, I was about seven or eight years old in a new domestic violence situation. Her mother had married a man who had suffered from severe childhood abuse, but also was bipolar. After this first nightmare, I had an out-of-body experience on the opposite end of the spectrum where I experienced speaking with God in heaven, and then being painfully forced to return to my body. As a two-year-old, I was forcibly held down and later sedated under general anesthesia, and mistakenly given iodine, which I had a bed a very bad reaction to, and might even have experienced a near-death experience. They had done this in order to remove a cyst from between my eyes. She says that the feelings were dread, despair, terror, utter helplessness, and resignation. And some associations she had were the red sky, perhaps the bloody womb, perhaps iodine, anesthesia, the earth cave and the female body, both as forced incubators, reincarnation, and then domestic violence Mm -hmm. and childhood abuse. So 
So this um, this dream brings up a lot of issues, right? This is a this is a nightmare that speaks to uh, trauma. It's it's not exactly a PTSD nightmare, although, uh, and we could maybe say why. So maybe this is a good opportunity to talk about PTSD nightmares. Um, uh, I guess I'll I'll launch in with that. So typically, we think of PTSD nightmares as um, rehearsing the exact events of the trauma. So Vietnam vets who repeatedly dream about um, seeing the car in front of them go over the landmine and blow it up and knowing that it just killed all their buddies. And that was something that happened and to see it again and again and again in the in dreams. So that's what we think about uh, as being real PTSD nightmares. And there, there's been some interesting uh, stuff written on PTSD nightmares from a Jungian perspective. But I, but I think it's differentiated from a trauma nightmare, which this is, which references a traumatic event yeah. but in somewhat metaphorical or symbolic language. And I think the key thing with both of these is that the images can get um, reworked and changed over time. So one of the things that happens with PTSD nightmares is they do gradually become more symbolic uh, as they continue mm -hmm. often. And, and so this dream, again, seems to replay this early trauma from when she was two years old. But uh, it, um, it obviously is not an exact replica, but it seems to be the psyche's attempt to work through or make sense of it somehow. Yeah. Well, the, the primary context in the dream is that the dream ego is chained. We're in a kind of Promethean a trap. So the setting, the color, all of those things are the larger setting. But to me, the primary message has something to do with being chained flat on one's mm -hmm. back. And she says, dread, despair, terror, helplessness. Yeah. So then we could also open that in, in a broader way. In what ways do you feel chained and helpless in all any domain, in all domains? People can feel chained and helpless in, in a career. They can feel chained and helpless in a relationship that they don't want to be in or don't feel they have choices. And even the image that, you know, she's chained, helpless, and is somehow an incubator uh, with no regard to her freedom or her other parts of her psyche. I mean, that's a, uh, that's a very mm -hmm. interesting, provocative yeah. idea. Especially for a seven-year-old. Right. Which I, I find uh, I find that really um, striking that a, a seven or eight year old would have a dream like this. Oh, well, I th I think it may not be altogether clear what the timeline is. But f first, I want to loop back to your reference, Joseph, to the Promethean situation, and in the in myth in Greek myth, uh, Prometheus stole fire from the gods. Uh, power and uh, all the differences that fire made. He gave it to human beings, and he was punished by the gods for doing this by being chained to a rock where every uh, day an, an eagle came and uh, attacked him and, and uh, ate his liver, and then every night it would be repaired. And so th your association to Prometheus is very resonant with this dream because it isn't clear. There's a two-year-old uh, trauma. There's a seven or eight-year-old trauma when her mother married a, a, a stepfather who was abusive. 
Um, and then there uh, is her recent trauma of having uh, twins uh, via, via cesarean under general anesthesia. So uh, there, there's a lot here that doesn't you know, follow a very clear uh, timeline, but it's all mixed together. And I think the stream is asking her uh, and saying, uh, time, time to process this. You, uh, you, you're ready to, to deal with it. And what I'm aware of in my own self and in my own body is a huge amount of feeling of, of grief and sadness and all the things she says, the despair and the helplessness. And, and maybe this dream is saying, uh, feel those feelings. Uh, that it's time to grieve. It's time to really let the feelings uh, be consciously felt and expressed. I would like to also step back in, in a really meta level because, I mean, what I'm about to say requires a, a very objective stance, a symbolic stance. So if we remove any of the, of the literalization of the dream, the dream ego has life inside of it. And perhaps there is some problem getting the life that is inside of this person out into the world. And something deep and underworld and phonic, this is the world of the Elysian um, and Orphic mysteries, that she has pulled down into this ancient mystery, and what is in her is forced to come out. Now, sometimes we have a creative potential inside of us, and for any number of reasons, we don't feel safe enough, it doesn't feel right, we're forestalling, uh, giving birth to something that is very significant inside of us, and for the unconscious to grab you and forcibly bring forth what we ourselves are too depressed, too frightened to bring forth can be a kind of medicine, even though the demand can seem really frightening at the time. Hello, listeners. Uh, we'd like to tell you once again about Dream School and a special offer that is available to you now through the end of the year. And that is to join Dream School at a 10% uh, holiday discount. And if you are interested, as we always hope you are, in understanding your dreams, please go to This Jungian Life. Dot com and use the code HOLIDAY2023. HOLIDAY is spelled with a capital H. Take a look. Come on board. As you know, dreams are important. So here's another nightmare that some wonderful listener sent to us. Um, it's from a 64-year-old woman who's retired and she called it invisible malevolent presence. There are people I know in a room that I enter, I sense a malevolent presence. I ask the people to leave because I think their fear is feeding this entity and making it stronger. Mm -hmm. I think that I can remain calm and thereby weaken the thing. The entity oh. pushes the rug and all the furniture to one wall. I am swept along with it now pinned to the wall and beginning to feel a rising panic. It then slams me against the ceiling. Now I am terrified and the entity is getting stronger and coming closer. And she notes that she had this dream when she was 25 and she doesn't recall any major life events at the time and that she's had versions of this dream occasionally but never as terrifying as the first one. And the feelings in the dream were she initially felt she had this confidence because she could recognize this entity for what it was and she could remain calm, but then mounting fear, horror, and dread. 
So I think, again, this is another common type of nightmare, kind of a common theme, just a sense of a kind of malevolent presence. I know I've had that same theme show up in my dreams. Mm-hmm. And I thought this was a really interesting version of that. Well, again, if I were to think very metaphorically, she, the dream ego comes into a room that is known to her and people mm-hmm. that she knows. So she's in a familiar part of the psyche. She intuits, feels a malevolent presence, and then she asks the people to leave because she's assuming other people are somehow feeding this malice. So now we're in the realm of shadow, Mm -hmm. that we do, we may have feelings of malice inside of ourselves, we project it onto other people, we think that they're malevolent, Mm -hmm. full of malice, and then we dismiss them as the ones who are carrying all of the darkness. But there's a correction in the dream, because she dismisses the people, but the malice remains. And its first action is to push the rug aside. So something's under the rug. We have this phrase of sweeping things under the carpet, unaddressed. Yeah. And so in a very concrete way, is there a sense of malice that's in the shadow, that's been swept under the rug, that is for reasons that we don't know, is demanding acknowledgement and that this sense of anger and revenge and ill will is strong enough to really paralyze the ego temporarily. I I would agree that her ability to remain calm, which is almost like a a mindfulness Mm. process to observe the shadow is really the best of all possible worlds. Be able to watch, not overreact, and to tolerate what we discover mm. inside the psyche. I think she has good reason to feel a little proud <laughs> that she's able to hold some kind of an objective attitude. <laughs> it's so funny because I see it totally differently. <laughs> yeah, go. Yeah, go for it. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. <laughs> oh gosh, because I see it. So she was a young woman at this time. What did she say? She's twenty-five. And I, I feel like there's a really hubristic, egoic attitude going on here. So she meets mm-hmm. something that's bigger than ego. So we might imagine that this is an encounter with the self. And the ego's like, I got this. I can remain calm. I can remain neutral. It's like, no, you can't. This is the transpersonal self, you know. And Joseph, taking a page out of your book, the ego assumes it's malevolent. But there's really no, Mm -hmm. I mean, we know it's powerful and we know it wants something of her, but we don't actually know that it wants to hurt her. I mean, it sweeps everything aside. It's going to disrupt everything. And it does, um, I'm just going to check the words here. It does, um, it does slam her against the ceiling. So it's really forceful, but, but it's, it is, it's a little bit like, um, you know, uh, Paul on the road to Tarsus, you know, it's mm-hmm. like you're you're gonna get swatted down by by the by the transpersonal force. So I, I don't know that I agree that it's so good that she can stay calm because I, I think that that is a kind of hubristic, arrogant attitude on the part of the ego. So good. I, I love is, all these different love perspectives. The controversy, yeah. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Uh, I was, I'm somewhere, I think, along uh, the lines um, that you've just delineated, uh, Lisa, of uh, the confrontation, a little different, with the confrontation between the ego and and something greater. And I also really started to imagine the dream setting and some of the words in the dream. Mm-hmm. That first of all, she's 25, so she's a young woman, and she's in a room. So a room has uh, floor, ceiling, walls. It is a contained, uh, delineated space. She gets 
asks all the other people to leave. Uh, and she believes, the dream ego believes she can stay calm. And then the entity pushes the rug and all the furniture to the wall. So nothing's going to get swept under the rug. Mm -hmm. uh, the rug's not there anymore. I am swept along with it. So I'm thinking about sweeping things under the rug or, you know, the force that sweeps us along against our will or despite our will. I'm thinking about being pinned to the wall. Uh, and what we say was, you know, I'm real, I was really up against it. Mm -hmm. Of yeah. The limitation within this context of the house of I'm against the wall. There's no more right. room. This right. is the space I'm in and that's all there is. Yeah, versus, it's a real confrontation. Right. Versus yeah. it could push me out the door and then I was outside and um, there was more. But it's a small space and there are no other options. And then it slams her against the ceiling. And again, this is my fantasy, but uh, thinking about the glass ceiling that people write about for women, but limitations that might be going on in a 25-year-old woman where well, you're in that stage of adulthood of, of having to navigate the world uh, within the confines of a room. Well, the, the other thing I'll say about the ceiling, though, is that it's interesting. If someone made you be stuck to the ceiling, you know, mm -hmm. if that happened in real life, if you were actually pinned to the ceiling, one of the things that would do would be to give you a broader perspective on what was going on in that room. Okay. You'd be, you'd, you'd be forced to look at things from above. So in a way, Joseph, uh -huh. that goes back to your That's... point about kind of being able yeah. to develop your reflective capacity, so. Yeah, yeah. But I'm just thinking she might have been in too small a container. Yeah, too yeah, small, that's Too true small too. a box. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and I also just want to add, you know, we got so many dreams of childhood nightmares and nightmares from young adulthood, but just years ago. Of, yes. Of how these things stay with us Mm -hmm. and, and want to be understood mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, of that there's unfinished business in the psyche. And it's sort of like, oh, I had this dream a long time ago, but I still want to understand it. So, and I think that, uh, you know, Deb, to your point, and, and I hope we can maybe move to childhood uh, nightmares in just a second, is the way that these nightmares, whether they occur in childhood or young adulthood or 20 years ago, whatever, what have you, become a central elucidation or expression of a core conflict in our mm -hmm. lives. Yeah. And, and what we'll see uh, in just a minute, it, when we look at Jung's childhood nightmare, that it becomes the framing question. And, and somehow, uh -huh. even at that young, young age, there's, there's some uh, kernel of this, uh, fundamental question that we must engage in our lives. And so I, I think you're right, Deb, you know, this dreamer had this dream many years ago, but, but somehow there it is, you know, this is, this is a question that yeah. is still relevant for her in some way. Yes, exactly. I liked what you said. It's a framing question that is still alive in the psyche. And one last thing I'd like to say is, um, she writes, I have had versions of this dream occasionally since, but never as terrifying as the first mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the wonderful things sometimes is the unconscious is giving us a similar message. It still wants us to hear something, but it seems like the medicine is being delivered little by little so that she's able to um, metabolize her fear around whatever this transpersonal force is. And of course, that's the right direction. Right, mm -hmm. right. That's great. So, so I'm just thinking for a minute about nightmares through history and our relationship with them and how we've understood them. There's that um, painting that I believe is called The Nightmare that I think we can all mm -hmm. call to mind of that woman lying in deep sleep and there's kind of a demon on us uh, perched on her. And that actually takes me to the etymology for nightmare. So as far as I understand it, um, the, the word mare 
uh, comes from an old Norse word meaning a female demon that sits on your chest and suffocates you and brings bad dreams. So the idea that nightmares are brought to us by demons, and of course, uh, actually the Italian word for <laughs> the Italian word for nightmare is incubo, which calls up the word incubus. So we've got the incubus and the succubus, and I, I don't know. Just jump in and, and help me out with this. What what about these demons who bring these horrific dreams? Well, I like I love that. There's an assumption that these strange messages come from a transpersonal source, whether it's dark or light. Yeah. But the, the sense that it's not the ego that's just making it up. Yeah. And I think that that is very much in alignment with how we think about dreams as Jungians. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, in ancient times, dreams were pretty universally seen as. Uh, messages from the gods. And they could be positive messages from the gods or uh, negative messages from demons. You know, and today we would say it's light and dark aspects of the psyche. Uh, but it's powerful. It's what makes nightmares so powerful is that they do come from a source that is, uh, carries all the power of the collective unconscious beyond just your own personal experience. And of course, uh, so, you know, we, we might say that, that it comes from a dark aspect of the psyche, but it could just yes. be a powerful part of the psyche that the ego experiences Ex as dark. Exactly. Right? Right. And the, the numinous dreams of inspiration and direction or uh, some fabulous new idea. The ego experiences those as, isn't this wonderful? And uh, the dreams that are, we call nightmares, the ego says, oh, that was awful. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's psyche, light and dark. Yeah, yeah. So, right. And um, I'm going and, to. Yeah, go ahead, Deb. Uh, I'm just going to create a, a segue out of that. Okay. Um, that. Uh, to take us back to Jung and how he had a nightmare when he was very young um, that is riveting and powerful. It's in his uh, memoir, uh, Memories, Dreams, Reflections. And he here's the dream. In the dream, I was in this meadow. Suddenly, I discovered a dark, rectangular, stone-lined hole in the ground. I had never seen it before. I ran forward curiously and peered down into it. Then I saw a stone stairway leading down. Hesitantly and fearfully, I descended. At the bottom was a doorway with a round arch closed off by a green curtain. It was a big, heavy curtain of worked stuff like brocade, and it looked very sumptuous. Curious to see what might be hidden behind, I pushed it aside. I saw before me, in the dim light, a rectangular chamber about 30 feet long. The ceiling was arched and of hewn stone. The floor was laid with flagstones, and in the center a red carpet ran from the entrance to a low platform. On this platform stood a wonderfully rich golden throne. I am not certain, but perhaps a red cushion lay on the seat. It was a magnificent throne, a real king's throne in a fairy tale. Something was standing on it, which I thought at first was a tree trunk, 12 to 15 feet high and about one and a half to two feet thick. It was a huge thing, reaching almost to the ceiling, but it was of a curious composition. It was made of skin and naked flesh, and on top there was something like a rounded head with no face and no hair. On the very top of the head was a single eye gazing motionlessly upward. He says, this dream haunted me for years. Only much later did I realize that what I had seen was a phallus, and it was decades before I understood that it was a ritual Phallus. Uh, Jung is writing this dream 
when he's around 80 years old. It's so vivid in his mind. And he says, only it became clear to me how exceedingly unchildlike, how sophisticated and over-sophisticated was the thought that had begun to break through into consciousness. Was it speaking to me? Whose mind devised it? What kind of superior intelligence was at work? Who spoke to me then? Who talked of problems far beyond my knowledge? Who brought the above and below together and laid the foundation for everything that was to fill the second half of my life with stormiest passion? Who but that alien guest who came from both above and from below? It was an initiation into the realm of darkness. My intellectual life had its unconscious beginnings at that time. Yeah, and he had this dream when he was uh, between three and four years old, right? He was very mm. young, and uh, what an overwhelming a dream of this imagery for such a young child. And Jung was able to hold it as unconsciously as a child, but as an initiatory experience mm -hmm. of the bringing the above and the below together and i think that is i think it's it's beautiful and and moving and awful all at the same all at the same time uh, he, he says of the dream that it was to preoccupy him all his life uh, and in, in some sense i think it, it does go yeah. back to the sense that these early nightmares that that we have and he, he does say by the way that he 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 woke up um, terrified and sweating and scared to death and was afraid mm -hmm. for many nights afterward to go back to sleep because he might have another dream like that. Yeah. So in some ways, this was a very typical kind of early childhood, uh, you know, terrifying nightmare. Um, but going back to what I said before about how it kind of raises up these core themes, there's some deep mystery that he's exposed to with yes. this dream. And it, 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 it kind of defies language, even, even for Jung writing much later in his life, he, you know, relates it to the ritual phallus and all of this stuff, but it, it still doesn't, doesn't quite convey the depth of the mystery that is uh, hinted at in this incredible image. And that that is part of what we call nightmares that there's something that, that will not get rendered into conscious cognitive boxes of, oh, it's because of this and that, and here's my complex around that and history. and so, that, that there is this realm. It is fascinating, uh, and it can preoccupy us for a lifetime uh, and even though we may not be able to just uh, wrestle it into uh, neat, rational uh, conceptions, there's a way in which we can live alongside it and live with it and let it live in us as a mystery. You, you know, and I want to say, I think all of the nightmares that we've looked at today, including this one from Jung and mm -hmm. some of the ones that I can think of that I've had myself, the, the basic underlying theme is that the dream ego encounters something uh, that, that, is, that, is, that is absolutely overwhelming. Mm -hmm. That the dream ego's sort of sovereignty or ability to manage the situation <sighs> or sense of um, being empowered is utterly negated and that we are rendered powerless and uh you know in in real life situations that render us powerless and overwhelmed are often traumatogenic that is kind of one of the definitions of trauma is that which really overwhelms us and renders us powerless mm -hmm. but on a psychological level that experience of uh knowing that our little ego is no match for this greater power, whether it's the sort of underground phallus or the tsunami or 
uh, the horror of the charred cats or the man who's um, got us chained to the table. It, it is an encounter with something deeper in the psyche that, uh, that is larger mm -hmm. than ego. Yeah. And it's humbling of that it is larger than, than ego uh, and will elude us in, in some measure, you know, perhaps for a lifetime, the way this dream did for Jung. And it's daunting to think that there is psyche writ large, you know, bigger than we are with its own creativity, darkness, and direction, as well as psyche's incredible powers to accompany us and companion us um, and inspire us. So let's take the last few minutes and talk about what do you what can you do if you're having nightmares? What 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 can you do if you're maybe having repeated nightmares and you're overwhelmed by them? What what uh what what comfort or advice can we offer to Well listeners? the first thing that can offer some form of containment is to write it down and to write it down with as much detail as possible. Mm. Because in that process, you're allowing that executive function inside of you, the ego, which in many ways is a containing force, to begin to take hold of the images, the feelings, the themes. Freud called it mentalizing, which is really what we know about even trauma work, that when we mm -hmm. mix that regulating part of the brain with something that's more primal, structure begins to be introduced into it. The second piece that someone could try, particularly if it's a deeply disturbing memory, is after you've written down the dream, to then write three additional endings to the dream that just mm. occur to you, but would somehow give you a sense of relief. <laughs> to to imagine the dream forward in three paths. Now, that is not um, specifically in the hands of the self, but it still is interesting. You may think you came up with those three other creative steps forward, but often the unconscious is whispering something into your ear. We don't know where the nightmare is going to go, but when we have a sense of options and various mm -hmm. attitudes with which to hold it, something inside of us might relax. I also think that when we think about nightmares as a communication from the transpersonal self, rather than, uh, say, a sign that we're going crazy or a signal that something might be going off the rails, that in and of itself is kind of containing. And then if we can approach the nightmare on that spirit and perhaps do active imagination with it, which Joseph in some sense I think is akin to what you're saying, you know. Sure. But but with a little a little bit more of the spirit of um saying to the, you know, nightmare figure that let's say the malevolent force, what what am what do I, what do I need to know? What are you here to teach me? And and seeing what comes up and doing this while you're awake, and does that then mm -hmm. change the nightmare? So to 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 try to move toward it with curiosity, and we'll quote Jung here again that we often we often invoke this quote that you know the face we turn toward the unconscious is the face it turns toward us. So if we're afraid of something in the unconscious, it's going to appear very frightening. If we take a step toward it and say, wow, I'm really curious about this. I wonder what's there. It's likely that the the fear component will be ratcheted down. And you, you can do that in journaling. You can do that in active imagination. Um, and, and the technique that we mentioned before, image rehearsal therapy, which is not Jungian, but does share some common uh, features with what we've just been talking about invites you to come up with an alternative empowering ending and then rehearse that imagery five ten ten minutes a day for yeah. a couple of weeks yeah. but but yeah. i think I think the spirit in that as well is in um let me take a step toward this mm -hmm. right. 
And and that is so uh, such a classic element of Jungian work and theory that we encounter uh, contents from the archetypal realm in monstrous uh, nightmares and other images. And it's not that we can just put them into little cognitive boxes, but what we can do is to personalize those images, to do exactly what you were saying, Joseph, of imagine three uh, other endings to this story, of live with it and rehearse it, uh, so that some of that archetypal power gets uh, lived in uh, by the ego and in the conscious realm. And I think Jung talks about this over and over again, of how do we become more conscious? How do we render the great, you know, sort of dark of the side of the archetypal realm? Well, we personalize it. We go toward it. We turn that friendlier face uh, toward the unconscious. Say, what are you here to tell me? I, I will not avoid you, deny you, um, or uh, bury my head in the sand. I, I will do something with this. Uh, I will encounter you. The last step that I find really helpful, particularly when I'm working with an analysis and in the room, is when they tell me a dream that's been disturbing, be very careful to write down all of the words, and then I'll ask them to tell the dream with none of the ego's assumptions. <laughs> because often the ego is bringing its own anxiety, but we don't know whether that belongs, which goes to how you had interpreted the dream where the woman had been lifted to the ceiling. So, for instance, I'm going to make something up. <laughs> I come to the front door of a building, building and I just know that there's, there are murderers running everywhere in the building. And then I open the door and step in. And then I creep into the kitchen and I can hear people slinging knives all around. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that they're going to chop my legs off. And I walk in and I see six old women who turn around and stare at me. And their eyes are like burning coals. Mm -hmm. And then they wake up sweating and crying. Well, if you take all the narration out, you know, I walk in a room, I hear chopping block sounds, and then I go into a kitchen, and there are six women who turn and face me. And that's mm -hmm. it. Yep. Right. That's all you know. That's all you actually know. That's, right. that's the whole pro stage production that mm -hmm. was right. made. And th there's a lot of things that could be going on <laughs> with just the action of the dream and not all of the story that the ego makes about it. You know, um, so just just a little um, aside on that, Joseph, just to build it out for a second. Um, I uh, the, the Science Museum downtown, the Franklin Institute has this uh, exhibit on the brain. And one of the really interesting things that you can do is sit down, put some headphones on, and you see uh, a man in a rowboat. And, and first you hear this very kind of pleasant music playing. And then you see the same scene again, but this time with very ominous music playing. And I, I think that maybe you're they're they're testing your heart rate or something at the same time. And the ominous music and this you, you understand the scene totally differently depending on the music that's playing. And it even creates a different physiological response. So I think it's perfect what you're saying. I mean, the facts in the dream are the facts. You walk into a house and you hear some noises and they're the women. And and it's almost like your brain, uh, the, the dream ego makes up a different story depending on kind yes. of the emotional quote unquote music. But we can we can question that in the dream and we can wonder, is this just the dream ego's perception of things or do we have any evidence from the dream itself that there is something say malevolent? Yeah, so the uh, dream ego, as we say many times is often the most unreliable narrator mm -hmm, in as yeah. much as the dream images are sent to act upon the ego and correct its attitude about things. Mm -hmm. So uh, as you had said, when we think of the nightmare as the teacher, the wise teacher, and sometimes the self 
brings a lot of energy and intensity to the encounter because it really wants our attention. Mm -hmm. And we can welcome just intense experiences as potentially transformative. Mm -hmm. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.